coming to the uh, LPI virtual seminar this week. Uh, our guest this week is uh, Dr. Roger Fu, who is assist Assistant Professor of Earth and Planetary Science at Harvard University, where he runs the Harvard Paleomagnetics Lab. Um, today, he will be talking about uh, magnetism in the protoplanetary disk using high-resolution paleomagnetism. Um, if you have not already, uh, please mute your microphones. And if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to type them into the chat, um, and we're, we will answer them at the end of the talk. Uh, with that, uh, take it away, Dr. Fu. Great. Yeah, so first, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, and I'm particularly excited to, uh, to talk to this audience about these results, I think, because uh, as you'll see, some of our results actually um, come from um, NASA and Arctic Meteorites. And as I understand, there's some people from the, from the JSC Meteor Curation Group um, here. So I uh, hope to show you those results. Um, okay, so I'll be talking about how we can use paleomagnetic laboratory techniques to understand magnetism in the proplanetary disk, and by extension, understand um, how nebular gas uh, and uh, the, the mass of the proplanetary disk is accreted, and maybe even some insights into accretion of the first protoplanets. Okay, so just to get her on the same page here, so this is just, just a timeline of the solar system. Um, the solar system itself is four and a half billion years old. What I'm, show, what I'm showing here um, is that the period of planet formation is much more confined in, in time. So in fact, uh, by the end of 100 million years after the initial formation of the solar system, we already had a full-fledged formation of all the major planets. And if we zoom in even closer into the first five or so million years, um, into the time where these uh, asteroid-sized bodies and protoplanets are created, well, we can see that um, things were happening at even a, a faster clip. So it, um, in this time scale, year zero is defined as the time um, of the formation of the protoplanetary disk which in the case of the solar system, I'll refer to it as a solar nebula. Um, so they might be kind of interchangeable in this talk uh, to mean the same thing. Um, and that protoplanetary disk formed from a much larger object known as an electron cloud at around zero million years. And that coincides with the time of the formation of CAIs, which are these uh, millimeter sized um, inclusions found in primitive meteorites that are the oldest macroscopic objects in the solar system. And that was followed by formation of chondrules, uh, which lasted in the next few million years. And these CAIs and chondrules, as well as other microscopic dust, uh, accreted together to form the first chondrites and their parent bodies. So these are asteroid sites, maybe larger objects. And we know that the uh, formation of chondrules and their parent bodies ceased by about four, four, four to five million years after year zero. And we interpret that to mean that this um, first stage of planet formation, where the, the planets and the, these particles were embedded in the accretion disk, um, was over at that time. So the protoplanetary disk itself had a lifetime of about four to five million years. Okay, and this age or this lifetime of the protoplanetary disk around the sun is uh, fairly typical. Uh, observing other stars with um, protoplanetary disk, we see that most of them last a few million years with accretion rates of about 10 to the minus eight uh, solar masses per year. So the solar system uh, was fairly typical, um, but if you step back, uh, this typical rate of accretion is actually pretty surprising. So it turns out if you just had laminar gas that are in the um, densities that one expects from a protoplanetary disk, um, it's actually very, very stable. So there's very little material flowing into the central star, much, much less than 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year. Um, so if you just had laminar gas in the disk, uh, you would actually predict that these these objects last longer than the age of the universe, uh, which means the, you know, there should be no planetary systems and only protoplanetary disks in the universe. 
So clearly that's not true. So some, some unknown mechanism in these proplanetary disks is making them accrete very rapidly. It is, it's helping the gas um, migrate inwardly very efficiently. Um, so people have recognized this problem for, for many decades. And in recent years, a lot of attention has focused on magnetic winds. So this is a um, cartoon of, of such a kind of wind. So you have basically these hourglass shaped magnetic fields uh, that penetrate the accretion disk itself. And the accretion disk uh, is made out of slightly ionized gases. So they're kind of attached to these magnetic fields weakly. And the idea here is that some small fraction of the mass of the, of the gas actually is flung out sort of, um, or flows out quickly along these magnetic field lines. Um, and so that outward motion of some fraction of the gas along these field lines counters the inward motion of the gas uh, in the midplane of the disk. So basically these magnetic field lines is a way for, um, for angular, moment, angular momentum to be drained away from the midplane of the disk. And that, according to these theories, is a way to get the gas uh, in the disk to, to migrate very efficiently. Uh, so here's one quantitative model. So this is uh, the, the y-axis is the half-life of the disk. So we're aiming for a couple million years. Um, x-axis magnetic field strength. So it's plotted in terms of the, this plasma beta parameter. So smaller number is actually stronger field. So as you can see, so for some range of magnetic fields, uh, you get disks half-lives that are a couple million years, which is in line with the observations. Um, so in theory, this process, right, these disk winds can mediate the, uh, the rapid accretion of the pr protoplanetary disk. Um, but this theory is, is untested in the sense that we don't have, um, or at least until a few years ago, we didn't have any direct measurements of magnetic field strength in the disk. So we don't know if the fields in the disk are actually of the right range to result in the lifetime that we expect. Uh, so that's one reason to maybe measure the magnetic fields in the proplanetary disk. Uh, another reason is this, um, uh, separate issue of the formation of the first planetesimals. Um, so we, we know that CAIs and chondrules and these kind of millimeter scale objects were abundant in the early solar system. Um, but it's been long known that it's very difficult for these millimeter sized particles to stick to each other and form a larger particle. So in recent years, um, there has been a lot of attention on these turbulent concentration mechanisms. Uh, so this is a simulation from, a, from an older paper, but it's, a, it's an oldie but a goodie. Um, uh, the physics are still pretty much the same. Uh, so what you're looking at here is looking down on a disk um, from some height above it. The sun is kind of to the left of this, this image, and you're going to see the um, gas in, in this image orbit upward. Uh, got a chat. Uh, okay, so we, had a, we have a quick question about the, um, the fields with the MHD flows in the, in the last slide, I think. So, yeah, so the fields, um, yeah, so indeed the fields have this geometry, right, this hourglass geometry because of the, the pre-existing fields um, in the molecular cloud. So the, there's, there's large scale, very weak magnetic fields in the molecular cloud that kind of get dragged into this hourglass shape um, once the disk is once the disk is formed, uh, and th yeah, so they're not actually extending in from the the proto sun. That's right. Uh, sorry. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah. So back to this this idea of turbulent concentration. Um, so that the Colors you see here are densities. So brighter means higher density of dust particles. So if you play this, you can see after some orbits, um, these concentrations of dust particles grow larger and larger. 
And the idea here is that eventually they get large enough to become self-gravitational and they form this little planetesimal that's, uh, that kind of skips past the step where little particles need to, need to stick to each other. Um, so you have this gigantic swarm of particles and they stick to each other due to gravity. Um, so the question here then is there, is there, was there enough turbulence in the proplanetary disk to make this happen? Um, it's not clear that's, that's the case, but one idea is that magnetohydrodynamical instability, so MHD instabilities, uh, were actually present in the disk and uh, led to the turbulent concentration. And that's another reason we might want to explore fields in the, in the proplanetary disk. And this third idea that I, I want to uh, bring up as, as introduction here um, is, is this idea of, of ring structures in proplanetary disks. So I think this is one of the maybe coolest things that come out of um, science of planet formation in recent years. So there are these really, really awesome um, some millimeter uh, observations from the ALMA uh, observatory in Chile of pearl planetary disks. And they, they pretty much all show a lot of structure. Um, so there's several dozen, uh, I think probably a lot more than that, um, of these, these objects observed up to this point. And pretty much all of them show these kind of ring and gap structures. So it's not really fully settled what causes these. So one idea is there might be planets that are clearing these gaps, right? They kind of um, attract away all the material in, in their immediate vicinities. Um, but another idea is that the same MHD instability that cause turbulence might actually lead to self-organization and lead to uh, the formation of these, these ring structures. So this is a simulation from a couple of years ago. Um, and there are actually no planets in this, in this simulation. This, the ring structures here are completely caused by uh, magnetic field instabilities. Um, so on the right here, the, the brighter regions are denoting higher densities. Yeah, so the magnetic uh, field in, in these disks or, uh, interacting with the ionized gas may have um, influenced strongly the, the distribution of solid particles in the disk and therefore by extension where the planets might be forming. Okay, so just to review these, these questions um, that I've raised about magnetism in the proplanetary disk. So it's suspected that magnetic fields might mediate the uh, inward accretion of the proplanetary disk gas, which therefore determines the lifetime of these objects. Uh, and magnetic uh, instabilities might have induced turbulence as well as these ring and gap structures uh, that strongly influence the, the accretion of the first um, protoplanets. So in the next half hour or so, I'd like to try to uh, try to show how we can at least contribute to answering these questions from, from paleomagnetic experiments. Um, so the first um, part of this talk, uh, the first set of results at least, uh, I want to talk about paleomagnetism of single chondrules or single inclusions uh, in in primitive meteorites. So chondrules, as I talked about before, are these kind of millimeter sized rock fragments found in, um, in primitive meteorites. Uh, and these chondrules are believed to have formed in these flash heating events uh, that lasted hours of days and went up to as high as about 2000 Kelvin. Uh, so it turns out if you heat and cool a, a rock in the presence of a magnetic field, uh, you can acquire what's called a TRM or thermal remnant magnetization. So here's in, uh, in cartoon form how this, how this roughly works. Uh, so here, here's a rock, this gray object here. In, in any natural rock, um, you're always going to have some ensemble of ferromagnetic minerals. So in earth rocks, this is usually magnetite. In meteorites, it's usually some kind of iron metal or iron nickel metal or also magnetite. Uh, but in any natural rock, even something as small as a chondro, you're going to have tens of thousands, if not millions, of these little magnetic grains. So for simplicity, I'm plotting eight of these magnetic grains, so those little white circles with arrows uh, indicate magnetite or iron nickel or one of these ferromagnetic minerals. 
And each of them has a magnetic pointing direction. It's kind of like a little compass. Uh, so if you heat a rock in the presence of a magnetic field, heat, there's, there's some fire, and you let it cool down in the presence of a, of a magnetic field, um, that actually can realign these uh, ferromagnetic domains in the direction of the magnetic field. And uh, the trick here, and the, the most critical uh, fact here, is that the alignment of these magnetic particles persists even when the original heat and the original magnetic fields are taken away. And in fact, the alignment of these particles, if nothing has happened to them, can survive over billion-year timescales. So if we can measure the degree of alignment of magnetic particles in a rock, like a chondral, we can back out how strong the, the original magnetic field was using this very simple uh, relationship. So the, uh, the degree of alignment is a quantity that we can measure. Um, we can uh, we call it M or magnetization. Um, and that's directly proportional to the original B field. Um, and this will become relevant in about 20 minutes, I think, but just pay attention um, to, the, to the case on the right here. So if you have zero field, um, then you basically get, end up with a random assortment of magnetic pointing directions. Um, so you don't get a zero magnetic uh, moment. You don't get a zero M, uh, you just get a very small M. Um, so all these cases um, are, are possibilities for, for what we see in a chondral. Okay, so let's try to uh, apply this idea to, uh, to some meteorites. So this is uh, a meteorite called San Marcona. Um, it's quite famous in the, in the meteorite circles it's because it's one of the most primitive um, chondrites uh, that have been described. It's a uh, ordinary chondrite, so it's the, it's the type of meteorite that's most common on Earth. Um, but it's, it's one of the very few of these ordinary chondrites that have not seen very high metamorphic temperatures on its parent body. And, and so we can isolate some of the chondrules in this meteorite. So especially, uh, I'm gonna zoom in on this one here. And this, uh, this chondrule has what are called dusty olivine um, grains in it. So uh, you can see this kind of sparkly texture. So actually each of those sparkles is an iron nickel grain. Uh, and in fact, they're very small iron nickel grains. If you go, go in it with a TEM, you can actually see they're, they're kind of 100 micron scale. Um, iron nickel metal um, crystals. Um, so what's really um, convenient about these uh, dusty iron grains is one, they're ferromagnetic, so they, they can act in the way we described earlier to record a, a magnetic field. Um, but also we know from um, uh, petrological arguments that they formed during the formation of the chondral itself. So when the chondral was heated up to 2000 degrees and cooled in a, in a propanthary disk, that is when these iron grains form. So we know that they are original, right? They're not formed sometime later in the, in the meteorite's complex history. And so these grains actually witness the magnetic fields in the propanthary disk and in theory should record something about their, their intensities. Um, before we go on, though, um, we have to try to argue to ourselves or convince ourselves that the, any signal we get from this chondral is really coming from this population of grains, right? Because um, all these meteorites have gone through a lot of aqueous alteration as well as impacts and other things on their parent body. So there's other populations of magnetic grains in these, in these chondrals. So how do we know that the signal we see from these chondros is coming from this population of grains? Um, so we can actually make a little map. This is transmitted light map of the, this particular chondral. We can map where the dusty olivines are. And we can use a magnetic uh, microscope. So this is uh, a technology that we developed in our, in our lab called the Quantum Diamond Microscope, or QDM. It allows us to obtain very high resolution, so a few micron resolution um, maps of magnetic fields. So if we take a QDM map of this particular chondro, it looks something like this. So all these red and blue areas are regions of strong magnetism. 
Uh, so you can see most, um, if not, I mean, not all, but the vast majority of these, these large magnetic signals are associated with the regions of dusty olivines. So if we take a measurement of this chondro as a whole, we can be confident that most of the signal is coming from this very primitive population of, of magnetic rings. So that's, that gives us some confidence. All right, so then we actually do the measurement. So this is um, the same chondro. We, we cut it out and separate it from the rest of the meteorite. This is the, the region in, in green there is the, I'm highlighting as the region with the most dusty olivines. And then we can take a very low resolution magnetic field map. Um, so in here, so the red is magnetic fields kind of coming out of the screen. Blue is magnetic fields going into the screen. So this magnetic field pattern is um, what's expected if you have basically a little bar magnet sitting at that location. So you have the field coming out the north side and going into the south side. Um, so we can take this map and we can quantitatively um, invert this map for the pointing direction as well as the intensity of this, this little bar magnet, this magnetization that's in, that's in this chondral. We can plot that direction on a equal area diagram. So um, this is a way to represent unit vector directions. Um, so imagine you're looking down at, this, at a sphere and these solid points like this one here is a unit vector that's pointing down. And then you'll see some hollow symbols as well. Those are unit vectors that are kind of pointing out. Uh, the little um, oval around the point is the uncertainty of that pointing direction. Uh, so this, this particular chondral, we can um, show that, see the, the direction is kind of pointing mostly to the right, and maybe a little bit down, and that's the direction we see here. Uh, if we measure the magnetic signal of a few other chondrules, so we measure two other chondrules, uh, and for each chondrule we split it in half, right? So the pair of blue points are two halves of the same chondrule, and then the two red points are the two halves of the different chondrule. And you can see inside each chondrule, the magnetization directions are uniform right, within uncertainties. But if you take a whole bunch of chondrules, um, so each color represents a distinct chondrule now, uh, the, the mutual directions of these chondrules is random. Right? So there's no clustering going on here. Um, so the conclusion here is that within single chondrules, the magnetization directions are uniform, but they're random among the different chondrules. And what this tells us is that the magnetizations within these chondrules must have been um, imparted to them before the, the formation of the meteorite. Um, so, uh, so that's how uh, you have each chondral landing on its parent asteroid differently, right, when the asteroid is created. So you get random directions among them, but each one is carrying a, a uniform record of the magnetic field when it was formed. So basically, this pattern of magnetization in this, in this meteorite uh, lets us feel pretty good about interpreting the, the signals of each of these chondrules as a record of the, the probe-hanthory disk magnetic field, because we know the signal has to predate the formation of the asteroid, right, which happened just a couple million years after the beginning of the solar system. Okay, so with that confidence, we can take the intensity of the, the magnetization. Uh, we can do some laboratory kind of calibrations to figure out the magnetic field strength in which it formed. We can say that the nebular magnetic field in which these chondrules formed was about 50 microteslas, which happens to be maybe like a factor of two or one and a half stronger than the, than the Earth magnetic field that you're standing in right now. Uh, so we can plot this, this result in, in this space. So this is um, intensity of the field on the y-axis. And our best guess of where this meteorite comes from and where these chondrules are coming from. So we, no one's really sure where any particular meteorite um, comes from exactly. But since this is an ordinary chondrite, we think it's probably from the inner part of the asteroid belt. Um, so we give it some, some range of um, possible formation locations in the inner solar system. 
Uh, so this data point looks kind of lonely, just sitting there by itself. So as you can probably guess for the rest of this talk, uh, we want to add a few more data points here. Uh, so in particular, the right side of this diagram is pretty vacant. Um, so that leads us to the question of what's going on in the outer solar system. Uh, so there's been this idea that carbonaceous chondrites, which is uh, another major group of meteorites that fall, fall to Earth, they are uh, much more um, water rich and they probably come from farther out in the solar system, possibly from beyond the orbit of Jupiter. This is one model that, that claims this. Um, but in any case, they're, they're, they're from farther out in the solar system than ordinary chondrites. So if we can recover a, a similar magnetic record from some populations of carbonaceous chondrites, we might be able to uh, fill in some data for the outer solar system in terms of how strong the magnetic field is. Uh, so we turn to this meteorite, which used to be at JSC uh, until we took it. Uh, well, small fragment of it. So this is GRA95229, it's a CR chondrite. Um, so this is a, a different, this is one of the subclasses of carbonaceous chondrites and it's believed to be from the outer solar system. Um, and we picked this chondrite uh, specifically because it has been shown to have a very low metamorphic history. So it never got heated to more than a couple hundred degrees, which is good if you want to preserve magnetism. Um, and specifically, we went after this particular chondral because it has the, these uh, little inclusions on its rim uh, that are very rich in iron sulfide. So these kind of yellowish looking grains here. So this, this chondra doesn't have dusty olivines, it doesn't have those nice iron nickel metals that we saw in the last meteorite, but it has these iron, um, iron sulfides, which is kind of the next best thing. So we isolated a bunch of these iron sulfide um, rim uh, inclusions, and we did the same kind of analysis and uh, recovered a, a magnetization intensity and direction from them. And when we plot them on a stereo net, we see that they're very scattered in, in direction. Um, so this is actually very different from what you see in Simracona. Um, so notice that in Simracona, the, the chondral subsamples, so i.e. The, the data points of the same color are actually in the same direction. Um, on the left side here in, in GRA95229, you get a bunch of random directions within the same chondral. Okay, so this seems to mean that um, there is no um, uniform magnetic field that magnetized GRA95229, unlike the Simracona chondrules. So this kind of get back, gets back to this cartoon. So uh, the case on the right here, where you have very low magnetic fields, um, the magnetization is randomized at local scale. So if you take one piece of this meteorite, or this chondro, you can get one direction, you can take another piece and you can get a different direction. So that's, that's, that would explain what we're seeing here, um, these random directions within the same chondro. So we can try to quantify this a little bit. Um, so magnetic field is not really zero, um, but it just means it's weak. It's weak enough so that there was no strong unidirectional magnetization acquired. Uh, and we can do some laboratory experiments to quantify how weak is weak. Uh, so in this case, we can take these exact same iron sulfide rich particles and we can give it a laboratory mag magnetization. So we give it a magnetic, um, uh, a magnetization in the direction of the star in, in the right diagram. And if the magnetic field that we apply in the laboratory is 15 microteslas, you can see that the directions of these particles uh, align pretty well. They cluster pretty well around um, the star direction. But if you decrease the laboratory magnetization to, say, 10 microteslas, um, then they become a lot more scattered. You might say it's not quite completely randomized, but it's, it's getting, getting pretty close. It's getting pretty close to reproducing the randomness of the, of the naturally observed directions. So what, we're, what we can conclude here is that the field in which um, this chondro from GRA95229 form is less than about 10 microteslas, because if it were more, you would see cluster directions instead of these, these random directions. So we give it this, uh, we can put this second, 
theta point on this on this diagram. Um, this is an upper bound, right? So we ju we're just saying the field wasn't stronger than about 10 microteslas. We don't know how weak it was. And we can compare these data points to the magnetic fields uh, expected uh, for nebular turbulence driven by magnetic fields. So the, in this gray region, the lower bound of the gray region is kind of the minimum, minimum magnetic field necessary to drive accretion of the gas at the rates that, that we expect. So again, stronger the magnetic field, the faster it's driving accretion of the disk into the central star. So above that line, you're in the zone where the field is strong enough to do this. And then the, uh, the upper bound, which isn't really a hard bound, but it, it's kind of a, a typical value um, for uh, magnetically induced turbulence, right, which stirs up the magnetic field and amplifies it. Um, so what we can see is both of these data points are, are solidly in this regime where it's strong enough to, to introduce um, rapid accretion of the propagandary disk. And especially in the case of Semarcona, it's actually strong enough that it really uh, points to, to turbulence um, induced by magnetohydrodynamic effects. So um, based on these two studies um, of, uh, of magnetic fields recorded by chondrules, um, I think what we can conclude is that there, there was sufficient magnetic field intensity in the, in the proplanetary disk that inward accretion of the disk was probably strongly influenced, if not dominated, by, by magnetic fields, and that these magnetic fields are also strong enough to set up um, instabilities that cause turbulence. So at least this is one way to set up the turbulence necessary to, to make planetesimals, at least according to these turbulent concentration models. Okay, so I talked about um, taking a meteorite and extracting these tiny, tiny little chondrules uh, for information about the proplanetary disk. So is there another source of information? And the answer is yes. So actually, there have been some studies since these, uh, these uh, early chondral studies where, where people actually took the whole meteorite, so the bulk meteorite that includes both chondrules and CAIs and, and matrix material, and found that those that the rock itself was exposed to some magnetic field. And they used that, um, those, that, uh, that bulk material to put a number on the magnetic field in the, in the nebula. Uh, so again, this is not looking at individual chondrules anymore, but the whole rock. Uh, so two of these studies, one looked at CM chondrites, and another looked at this ungrouped uh, carbonaceous chondrite called WIS um, 91600. And they both showed um, fairly weak magnetic fields, so somewhere between the range of about 2 to 10, maybe a little more, microtesla. Uh, and they're all carbonaceous types, so they're probably from out uh, farther in the, in the propentary disk around the region where the CRs are from. So all this so far is very consistent with this idea of strong fields uh, overall, that's enough to mediate accretion, um, but weaker fields in the outer solar system compared to the inner solar system, which is what you would expect uh, from these, these models. Um, but the models actually make another prediction, uh, which is that not only should you get uh, generally weaker fields in the outer solar system, wherever, wherever you have um, magnetic instabilities, you should also have large gradients in the magnetic field. Right? So this model in the lower left here, actually this is showing magnetic field strength, so red is stronger. Uh, and also on the, on the right diagram here, also red is stronger magnetic fields. And you can see there's something like an order of magnitude difference in magnetic field strength in some parts of the disk. Uh, compared to surrounding regions. Um, and so far the data doesn't show that yet. Um, so either that means the solar system was much more calm or didn't have these kind of structures, or there's something wrong with these, these models. Um, these don't ex actually exist. Um, however, there's one data point that I haven't talked about. Um, that may actually be some evidence that there, there were these heterogeneities in the 
curl tensor disk that forms the sun. Um, so this is a meteorite called a yende. It's a CV type carbonaceous chondrite. It's one of the most studied rocks of all time because it's one of the easiest, um, easiest to obtain carbonaceous chondrites um, out there. So um, a number of studies in the past uh, 40 years have actually shown that Allende carries a very strong unidirectional magnetic uh, magnetization. So this meteorite was actually uh, formed, or at least it was exposed to a very strong magnetic field in the early solar system. Uh, and many different laboratories have confirmed this. So the data looks something like this. This is actually the very first study of Allende um, magnetism. So you see those black dots in the upper left, the upper left there, those are actually the magnetic pointing directions of the interior of Allende. And those triangles that are going off to the lower right are magnetic directions of the fusion crust. And that's the surface of the meteor where, where it was heated in the Earth, Earth's atmosphere. So the fact that you have a distinct direction in the inside of the meteor compared to the surface shows that the inside of the meteor is carrying, carrying an ancient pre-Earth magnetic uh, component. And that magnetization was acquired sometime in the early solar system. So then the question is, what was this magnetic field that magnetized the Yende? And the reason I didn't include this data point over here is because this is actually pretty controversial. It's not clear that this strong magnetic field really applies to the proloplanetary disk. Um, so one of the, the recent studies, a uh, very comprehensive study by Karporzin et al, 2011, they argue that the field um, is not due to um, the proloplanetary disk, but it's actually due to a core dynamo. Um, so they argue that this meteor actually came from the outer shell of a body that has a differentiated interior with an iron core, and that iron core generated, generated a magnetic field. And they conclude this because they, they rule out these other mechanisms. Uh, so there are these uh, proposed um, impact generated fields that last only for hours to days after the initial collision. Uh, if that's the case, then they wouldn't be recorded in Allende because Allende cooled over millions of years. Right? So if the acquisition of the magnetization took that long, you wouldn't record a magnetic field that only existed for, for hours. Uh, and they also rule out the uh, possibility of nebular magnetic fields because they argue that the age of the magnetization is later than the time of the, the proloplanetary disk. Okay, so then by process elimination, the core dynamo is the most plausible explanation here. Uh, now, this conclusion has been challenged uh, in recent years. So this is a study in recent years showing that actually if you have um, uh, impact heating of a meteorite like a Yende, where you have very porous matrix material right next to very um, competent you know, solid chondrules, then um, actually the heating uh, caused by the, by the impact is highly concentrated in the matrix. So in the right diagram here, these are these kind of green, yellow, warm colored regions, that's the matrix. And those round blue or purple spheres are the the chondrules that actually stay at low temperature. So instead of taking millions of years to cool, the matrix might only take a second to cool because you have a local heat sink in the form of those chondrules right there. So the heat goes into the chondrules, you have cooling on, on the order of seconds. And so you can record an instantaneous magnetic field generated by impacts. So kind of revive this idea of impact generated fields recorded on the ending. Okay, so is this, is this really a viable alternative to the, to the core dynamo model? Um, well, so this actually makes a prediction, right? Which is that if you heat the matrix to some high temperature um, and then cool it into the chondrules, then everything in the matrix should be uniformly magnetized. Right? Because all different regions of the, the matrix are, are heated. So we can test this using the QDM, right? So we can image the, mag the, the magnetic signal of localized regions in the matrix and see if, the, if the, the magnetic record in different parts of the matrix 
are consistent with each other. Um, so on the left here, I have a uh, equal area diagram. So these, these gray points are the bulk Allende directions. So you take a piece of Allende, includes chondrules, CAIs, and matrix. You measure it, it has this very consistent pointing direction, right? And this is the, the magnetization that records some kind of magnetic field in the, in the early solar system. If this, con this impact generated field scenario were true, then all different parts of the matrix, if we were to image it separately, should have the same magnetic pointing direction as the bulk samples. Okay, so we can do this by, um, by finding regions in the matrix where there are, for example, iron nickel metals uh, that are magnetic. We can image that with the QDM. So again, we have this plot of magnetic fields over this region. And again, we can invert this quantitatively to, um, to compute the direction and the intensity of the magnetic moment. And we can plot that again on the steering net diagram. So you have this kind of southwesterly direction. And as you can see, it's very far from the, the bulk direction. Uh, and we can do this for more samples. Uh, so it turns out when we focus on matrix sulfides, uh, which are these red points, you can, you can more or less reproduce the direction um, of the bulk magnetic field. But if you look at the metals, so these are the iron nickel grains, uh, they're actually widely scattered and has no clustering at all in the bulk direction. So this is actually uh, contrary to the prediction made by the impact generated fields model. Um, instead, what I think is going on, this is probably the, the, the most likely explanation, is this thing called a CRM, or a chemical remnant magnetization. So in this case, you have the same setup as before. You have magnetic minerals in the presence of a magnetic field. But instead of heating, which affects all the grains, you have chemical alteration. And the chemical alteration affects different grains differently uh, because they have different, different compositions. So maybe this iron sulfide is altered in the presence of a magnetic field, uh, whereas the iron nickel metal didn't. In, in this case, you can, this is one easy way to explain why one population of magnetic grains like the iron sulfides could carry a magnetization that's different from another population of grains. Um, so I think that means the impact generated fields hypothesis is, is uh, not likely to, to explain the magnetization patterns in the Yende, because again, it would predict uniform magnetization in the matrix where we found that only a certain grain population, iron sulfides, carry the, uh, the magnetization. Um, so then the question is, what's the age of this iron sulfide alteration, right? Because the age of the iron sulfide alteration would determine the age of this magnetic field in which, in which it was, um, in which the, the, the iron sulfides acquired its magnetization. So the previous study in, in 2011 had argued that the age of alteration in Allende is quite late. All right, so they cited mostly these iodine xenon system results from Allende chondrules and CAIs. So most of these ages are past or later than the point of nebular dissipation. That's about 4 million years after CAIs. Uh, and also manganese chromium ages are also pretty late, several million years after the end of the nebula. Um, but it turns out things have changed in these 10 years. So first of all, there has been some direct studies of magnetite in our, in, um, using the I9 Xenon system in the and they show fairly early ages, um, averaging about one million year before the end of the nebula. Um, also, because of our results here, we, we appreciate more that the magnetic signal of these, uh, of Allende is carried mainly by the iron sulfides in the matrix of the meteorite. So um, that matrix age um, shown in this diagram, now that age itself has been known for a long time, um, but it's probably more relevant to the magnetization of Allende than all these chondral uh, ages, right? Because again, we, we show that the matrix iron sulfide is what's actually carrying most of the magnetization. 
And finally, the manganese chromium ages have been revised because of uh, different calibration um, that people have accepted uh, in more recent years. So uh, the, the key point here is that alteration um, of magnetic minerals in Allende is believed now to be quite early, um, probably before the end of the solar nebula, um, and at least with an error of the, the end of the solar nebula. So the magnetization at Yende actually is old enough to record a magnetic field from the proplanetary disk. Uh, this comes with an assumption that the alteration was fairly fast. Um, so there are different ideas of how fast alteration was in Yende, ranging from tens of year time scales to million years. So this will only work if you're kind of on the, on the faster side of that. But with that caveat in mind, the idea here is that the magnetic field uh, we see in Yende might represent uh, probe hand her disk fields. And in fact, I think it's, it's probably the, it's the more likely explanation compared to the core diamo. Okay, so um, with that insight, I think maybe we, we feel bold enough to plot the CV chondrite uh, data point in the same diagram as these other data points and argue that that data point really represents a record of, of probe hand her disk fields. So if that's true, uh, then you have these large gradient in, in magnetic fields in the outer solar system. All right, so again, we don't know exactly what radius um, the CV or any of these ultrachondrite groups comes from. So one easy way to explain why this magnetic field is so much stronger than was recorded in these other carbonaceous chondrites is simply that there are large gradients um, similar to what's been observed in other propentary disks. Um, in the outer part of our solar system when it was forming, and that these meteorites are sampling the stronger and the weaker parts uh, of the outer solar system. Okay, so just to conclude here then, the, the second part of this uh, talk where I, I concentrated on Allende and CV chondrites, um, we find that the magnetization was probably acquired during uh, matrix iron sulfide alteration which means it probably was early, early enough to record uh, the nebular magnetic field. And if so, then that would mean um, there's evidence, there's direct experimental evidence um, for um, these, these ring and gap structures in the, in the early solar system. That might have been formed by, the inter, by interaction uh, between the gas and the planets, or it might have been formed by magnetic turbulence. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Um, so uh, I'll leave the, the conclusion slide up and um, please ask questions. very much. <laughs> that was a great talk. Um, does anybody have any questions? I see that uh, the question Dave answered, Dr. Kring answered uh, a little earlier in the talk. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Fu, this is Alan Treeman again. Um, I was wondering about your results on the CR chondrite. Um, and I, I forget whether you said that was in sulfide or metal, but I've looked at a couple CR chondrites and the metal grains there are, are quite a bit larger than the little bitty ones that you showed in Semarcona. And I'm wondering if the size of the metal grains has any, any bearing on its ability to retain uh, magnetic fields. Yeah, uh, yes, the answer is, is very much so. Um, which will make it a little bigger. So, uh, yeah, so the, all this white stuff, as, as uh, you know better than me, it, th this is all iron nickel metal. So this is uh, very large. And actually, yeah, so larger grains like this is very bad for recording magnetic fields. And basically it's because uh, if they're big enough, different parts of the grain kind of interacts with itself. Uh, so if you're, any, if you're like an electron, you know, sitting in the middle of this grain here, you're kind of seeing the field produced by the rest of the grain. 
more than the background field that we trying to that we wanted to record. Um, so that's why we kind of steer away from these regions um, and, and concentrate on the, the these sulfide rooms, which have much better um, uh, kind of magnetic recording properties because of the, the fine grain nature. Um, but yeah, so that that's why actually also that I think probably one of the main reasons like these studies have taken so long to do. Um, Right, the Simarcona study what came out in 2014, right? Like people knew about dusty olive things for decades, but, mm -hmm. but the problem is that it's mixed in with these other, you know, coarser iron nickel grains as well as oxides in the in the matrix. But until we had these imaging technologies, right, where you can isolate the, the magnetization at local scales, um, it wasn't really possible to measure it. Yeah, so so basically, yeah, we 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 are on a hunt for fine grain particles, and that's why we um, explicitly avoided the, the coarse grains and the CRs. Mm -hmm. So how big, how big, how small do the sulfites have to be for you to be pretty sure they've got single domain? Yeah, um, yeah, so they don't need to be single domain. They can be in kind of this like single vortex region that's kind of a little bit more flexible, a little bit bigger. Um, Oh yeah, it's different from different minerals. So yeah, for iron sulfides, um, where the main magnetic mineral is puritite, you're looking at a few microns probably where you get the kind of transition to single domain. Uh, and then like kind of 10 micron, yeah, few micron up to 10 micron might be kind of like still in the okay range. Uh, for iron nickel metal, it's really, really stringent. You're down, you have to be some micron to to be in a kind of a good zone for uh, for lack of interactions. So if anyone finds very primitive uh, fine grained uh, iron sulfides or iron nickel metal in these meteorites, you know who to email. Okay. Yep. Will do. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make an observation about the sulfides in that picture? Of course. Um, so they're not spherical, and um, if the sulfides or metal is um, precipitating either in a silicate melt or from the nebular ga gas, one would expect them to be spherical. And so the fact that they have some angularity to them suggests that they have been um, recrystallized or maybe have been affected by some type of subsolidus process. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's uh, exactly what we what we uh, we thought as well. So, um, so the idea that I think so Devin Schrader and well, who was actually co-author on this on this study with me um, uh, came up with for the formation of this is that. Um, there's actually X solution um, going on at about five or 600 C um, during the kind of later part of the cooling path of the, of the chondral. Um, and that's when you had uh, the X solution between the, uh, the, the nickel rich penlandite phase and then the, the uh, more magnetic pyrotite phase that we're actually detecting here. Um, so the lucky thing for us is that, um, so Devin thinks that this happens at five or six hundred Celsius, which is above the Curie point um, for for iron iron sulfide. So by the time it's getting down to three hundred degrees, which is when the, the iron sulfide starts to become magnetic, um, it's already gone through that exhalation process. Um, so I think it's um, it should be for for our purposes a, a thermal remnant magnetization. Do you have any other questions? Feel free to either uh, ask, uh, unmute and ask, or you can type them in the chat. What do people think about uh, the dynamo in CV's hypothesis? I know it's controversial. Um, wondering what what other people think. 
I kind of got into the field right when that idea kind of came came out a few years ago. Uh, as, as I understand it, 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 it's maybe a little more accepted now, but maybe not. Uh, I'll speak up. This is David Crank, since I've studied Allende for a lot of years. Um, the, the problem with the idea is that there's, there is no juxtaposition of differentiated material with the primitive material. Uh, and, and, and prior to that idea being floated, it was perhaps idealized uh, thinking that if you reached melting temperatures, you would melt or metamorphose right up to the surface and you wouldn't have a, um, a, a low nebular uh, sediment preserved on the surface. So th that issue still is uncomfortable. It, it's not, um, doesn't disqualify the idea completely, but it's, it's uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Right, you need like continuous accretion, right? To, uh, uh... Yep. Yeah, Keep potentially accretion on top of your, your heated body or accretion as the body is continuing to cool. It, it becomes complicated and, and that, that in itself is, doesn't undermine the argument. We oftentimes, when we start studying problems, have these simple idealized models and, and we're eventually having to face geologic reality. So I am not one of those people who wants to, who, who dismisses the concept simply because it's messy. Um, but I would like to see some type of evidence that seems to suggest it works. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 these bodies were severely impacted. There's a collisional evolution to them. So at some point in time, you would think that there would be some juxtaposition of deeper material with surface material. And, and maybe there is in some fragment that never has reached the earth, at least reached the earth in recent times. Um, but again, it's, it's, there's a lack of evidence. Yeah. All right, so you want to see like a Brescia or something with like a molten CV material next to a bunch of yeah. primitive. Yeah. So it's unsettled science. What? Yeah. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Fu? Well, I, since, since we have time, Sean, I, I just want to say that, yeah. that a couple of chondrules that Roger's pulled out here are just extraordinary. And, and he's, he's kind of left out some of the stories. So Roger, if, if you don't mind, if, as a petrologist, can I just say a couple of things? First, with this, this chondrule that you have here from uh, uh, in front of us, that, that's a layered chondrule. And uh, the, the previous interpretation of these types of chondrules is molten chondral after molten chondral accreted around a core chondral. So I, I, I was, it, you can't see it because it's behind this inset, but it looks like there may have been three or four droplet accreted to form this little thing. Yeah, so one, two, three, plus that sulfide rim. So maybe four, four accreting uh, events at, at different times. Yeah. And, and then for those of you who, who don't, aren't familiar with the dusty olivines, that's a, that's a relic grain. That, that's one of the dust ball constituents that existed before the heating event that caused the chondral melting. And, and that, that particular crystal survived that melting process. And because the um, redox state or the, the oxygen fugacity of the nebula decreased during that chondral forming process, all of that metal popped out of that olivine. And it, and it popped out along the crystallographic axis, which is why it's, it's so aligned. So the, the, these chondrules that, that Roger is studying are just, they're just, they're beautiful objects. Unfortunately, they're also rare objects. Yeah, but um, yeah, thanks for the, for the background there. That's, that's great. Awesome. Well, this has been a really great talk. Uh, I see a lot of uh, silent, as Lisa puts it, silent clapping in the chat. Um, so we really appreciate you in, in coming out to talk with us. Uh, it's been a really good time. Um, so for 
Uh, next week is, of course, LPSC, so we will not be having the virtual seminar next week. Um, after that, uh, so, so everyone is aware, we are um, going to be moving the time of the seminar to three o'clock central time, um, and that's just to better accommodate uh, folks' schedules. Um, so going forward, this seminar will be at 3 p.m. central, um, and we will send out an announcement uh, about our next speaker after LPSC. Sure. But thank you so much, for everyone, for coming. Thank you again, Dr. Fu, for your talk. Um, and everyone have a great afternoon. All right.